Well, in the first part of a bull market in commodities, the commodity will move first. And people are, are not as comfortable with the tertiary parts of the trade. And that's like some of the uranium small cap miners. The second part of the commodity cycle is like your big cap names. So your Cameco's. And so you're starting to see this, whereas you saw uranium move first, and then you saw Cameco move over last year. I think Cameco's up 300% the last, you know, three, four, five years. And now, yeah, so the next stage will be the, in the URNM names. And I think you need to own a diversified basket of them because there's, there's there's some bad companies in there, but some good ones. And um, the URNM is, is something that will allow that the, when, when the trade really develops into a bull market, the URNM will dramatically outperform the commodity for sure. Okay. So it sounds like you're looking forward to a uranium bull market over the next few years. Oh, yeah. I think yeah, we're in the early, the early innings, about the second, third inning. A Bloomberg economics reporter, Anna Wong, she recently wrote a column stating that the Fed has overstated <laughs> job numbers by at least 730,000. And then right after she released that, the JOLTS report came out and it showed that job openings have absolutely cratered. So what is all of that data saying to you about unemployment and jobs and where do you see that going? Well, in an election year, and we saw this in 08, um, I wrote this book about Lehman Brothers. It was the New York Times bestseller. It came out right after the financial crisis in 2008. It was called The Colossal Failure of Common Sense. And so I got to know a lot of these uh, famous economists and TV people. And I was a big part of the New York TV community. And when you have dinner with these guys, I'm like, and I'm not going to mention any names, but I'm like, you know, in 2008, the Republicans, and this is Republicans and De Democrats are both any party does this in an election year. They were shading the economic data up to the most positive way every single report in 2008. And so meanwhile, we're heading toward the, like, the largest financial crisis in the history of the world. But the reason it caught off, so many people off guard is that they were, the, 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 the Bush team was wanted McCain to win, and, to the, and that was toward the end of the year. They were terrified of Obama. They thought Obama was going to be this left-wing lunatic. Meanwhile, Obama turned Obama today would be a, like a centrist, you know. But nobody knew who he was, so they were pitching right. this, and they were terrified of, of this left swing. And so they did whatever they could to shade all the data. And so, to your point, is that year all the data looked, you know, looked fairly strong. Late two thousand seven, two thousand eight, and then nine months later, they they revised everything down and then the, then everything cratered. And so there was this massive deception in the election year on the economic data. I think the same thing is happening now. It's, it's, it's um, to your point, like full-time jobs are down almost, I think almost a million, but mm -hmm. you know, people are working so many part-time jobs to try to make ends meet. So that looks like job creation, but it's actually more families just struggling. That's sad. Um, let's stay on this consumer issue for a moment, Larry. A post-pandemic and interest rate raising campaign, the economy has been in this K-shape recovery. The top 5 to 10%, they're doing great. They're earning the highest risk-free interest you were just talking about on their piles of cash that they've earned in years. They're flying first class. They're using their American Express. They're snapping up assets everywhere you look. The bottom of the K that's saddled with increasingly expensive credit card debt, high inflation on the goods and services that they're consuming every day. And if they get a vacation a year, they're doing it on the cheap and they're, you know, they're, they're flying uh, regular class on, you know, discount airlines. What do you see happening next for the consumer? As long as this higher inflation regime, la you know, continues to last. Well, you bring up a good point. So there's, there's 7.3 trillion in money market funds today versus like, I think 3 trillion in 2019. So there's 7.3 trillion and the interest on that money has gone from 1% to five. And so that is creating this incredible divergence. And that's why American Express is trading a 20% 
premium uh, to Capital One. Capital One's your credit card to Mr. and Mrs. Joe Lunchpail, um, and they're the big sponsor for the NBA and the and NCAAs. So it's real middle America, uh, whereas American Express, you know, caters toward those people, you know, with the money market funds. And so the wealthy have had this huge pay raise. Um, the bottom 60% are dealing with inflation. They don't have a lot of savings. And so that's why we, we went through the Bear Trap Support. We went through uh, probably like 75 companies. And we have like the lines from the CFOs. And it's just whether it be Starbucks, McDonald's, it's company after company, Tyson Foods, Darden Restaurants, they're all talking about the pressures, the um, stresses on the consumer target and and how consumers are coming into the stores and they're buying less items. And so there's no question that it's like one part of the economy is in recession and the other part, the top 20% is booming. And so if you look at Ferrari versus, you know, or say Delta Airlines versus say JetBlue, uh, Delta, Delta and United are big, like big, big. Uh, I fly a lot of business class uh, for my for my speaking events, United is a huge business to travel. Um, whereas Southwest Airlines is once again Expedia. Those companies are catering toward you know, you know the bottom you know sixty seventy percent of consumers. And same thing if you look at Ferrari versus say Ford, it's the it's this massive divergence between these these equities. And it's is Stan Stan Druckenm Stan, Stan Druckenmiller always said. The best economist I know is sitting inside the stock market. And so you yeah. can see all of these things playing out in the market. So what do you see for the the bottom, you know, 60 to 80 percent consumer the longer this inflation holds out? It's, that's a scary thing, because what I talk about in my book is that in, and it's why inflation is so dangerous, because once the middle class is uh, impaired, then you have a real social problem. And so nobody knows how long it's, it's, it's going to, you know, this is how, how the damage, how, how far it can go. But if you just look at the savings rate, I can pull it up on Bloomberg, but uh, the savings rate is, is collapsed. Collapse. And But we know that there's seven trillion in money funds. So even though the savings rate's collapsed, so the, the and, and we know credit card expansion in terms of, people pulling out more credit, that's really exploded. So for right now, the credit expansion of the last year and the depletion of savings has pushed off any kind of, you know, real consumer stress, like hardcore, but that's just a, that's a ticking time bomb. Yeah. Okay. Well, Larry, I'm going to shift this over to energy. In your book, When Markets Speak, you write about how CapEx for energy companies is significantly lagging since 2014. And by some estimates, it's lagging by as much as $3 trillion. This is due to a combination of bad capital discipline after the 2014 bust and some government regulations. In other words, there's not been nearly enough good old-fashioned investments in coal, gas, uranium, oil, and metals exploration and production, especially in North America, in the last decade. Also, over the same time period, the global population has grown almost a billion people and there's going to be more than 120 million Asian citizens that are expected to move up to the consumer class over the next three years. All of that food, electronics, and other product consumptions, they all require energy. What do you see as being the impact of all of this on energy prices and supply moving forward? And what will be the impact of that $3 trillion shortfall in energy investments? Yeah, so I appreciate you. You've 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 you've, you've read the you know I, well, I I do these all the time, but you've really read the book, and those are those points are to the T, and it's and it's this massive disinvestment. Uh, we've taken five million jobs out of the United States. We've decimated the Rust Belt, but we've raised the standard of living globally, and so right. it's very clear that it's like when you suppress investment or supply, and then you juice demand. It's it's going to be an energy crisis in 2025, 26, 27, somewhere in there, where it's going to take to get that three trillion dollars. It's like that's like turning to get this investment back into oil and gas and metals. It's like turning around an aircraft carrier in the middle of the Pacific. It takes so long to turn it around. 
because you have to deploy all that capital. Right now, because of regulations and because of, like you said, the last boom and bust, uh, the CFOs, if, if you're a CFO of an oil and gas company, you've watched your previous three or four bosses get shot, you know, in terms of fired. And they're just they're just not deploying the capital until until we so it's going to be this massive suppression of supply uh, prices. And you're already seeing with copper. Uh, you've got suppression of suppressing the Panama closed down the mine for political reasons. Chile has a number of mines that have been shut down. So copper production and copper exploration is way, way off. It's at a literally dangerous level. And so copper price has gone up and that the, that higher price will eventually bring the investment back. But it's going to take you know, at least five to 10 years. So, you know, I'm getting the picture of that beach ball being held under the water. And then when you let it go, it just explodes higher. It feels like that's what's going to be happening based on what you're describing. Yeah, it's um, it's so hard to time it. Um, and and if you look at the global economy, like India, they keep raising their GDP assumptions. The China thing has been a drag because of they've made some miscalculations on the aging population. And they did obviously the lockdowns a year and a half ago, two years ago. And so China still hasn't come out of this yet. So there's some things that have that have helped the demand side in terms of in terms of that beach ball, yeah. but that's one when you get into that weaker dollar, uh, that'll really support the global economy, and then that's that really that once you get that weaker dollar, that really will juice demand for all kinds of commodities from from the developing world. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, so in your book, when markets speak, you share your analysis on nuclear energy and uranium. Uranium saw a doubling in price over the last year plus, reaching a high of just over $100 a pound. It's been digesting that <laughs> move for the last several months. And currently, the price of a pound of uranium is somewhere in the mid-80s, maybe a smidge lower. Almost every country on Earth, though, is now pledging much higher nuclear energy deployment and utilization over the coming decades. U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, she recently said, that to meet our goals here in the United States by 2050, we have to triple nuclear output. So massive energy demands are going to be placed on the grids, like you were talking about earlier, by the electrification movement, by the artificial intelligence movement, not to mention the explosion of the Asian middle class. What is your uranium thesis moving forward? And do you just like the, ye the yellow metal directly as an investment, or do you also like the uranium miners? Well, in the first part of a bull market in commodities, the commodity will move first. And people are, are not as comfortable with the tertiary parts of the trade. And that's like some of the uranium small cap miners. The second part of the commodity cycle is like your big cap names. So your Cameco's. And so you're starting to see this, whereas you saw uranium move first. And then you saw Cameco move over last year. I think Cameco's up 300% the last, you know, three, four, five years. And now, yeah, so the next stage will be the, in the URNM names. And I think you need to own a diversified basket of them because there's, there's there's some bad companies in there, but some good ones. And um, the URNM is, is something that will allow that the, when, when the trade really develops into a bull market, the URNM will dramatically outperform the commodity for sure. Okay. So it sounds like you're looking forward to a uranium bull market over the next few years. Oh yeah. I think yeah, we're in the early, the early innings of the second, third inning. Okay. So maybe it might last as long as a decade. I think so. Yeah. The bear market lasted over a decade. <laughs> so the bear market was from 2011, 10, 11 to yeah, for yeah, 2011 to, to 2020. So it's nine years of the bear market. Okay. So, Larry, there's been a lot of chatter over the last few years by experts and analysts alike that there's a coming rotation. You touched on this a little while ago, out of financial assets and into value or hard assets, commodities, precious metals. So what is your, you know, what's your view on a historic investment rotation into these commodities, hard assets, precious metals, and miners happening is this something similar to the uranium you see this playing out over the period of a decade or longer? And what's your time frame expectation? Are we already at the at the beginning of it, or is it still before us? Oh, it's way. But it's, we're very overall. We're at the very beginning because the the percentage of the S and P that's in 
industrials, oil and gas, metals, and uranium. Is um, last year I think it bottomed at thirteen percent, and I think now we're maybe fourteen, fourteen and a half. So we're seeing some rotation. So so if you think of if you think of like the composition of the S and P five hundred, uh, only about fourteen and a half percent of it is in industrials, metals, mining, oil and gas, you know, copper, uranium. And so in at the end of a typical bull market in commodities, those groups will, will be close to 45 to 50 percent mm-hmm. of the S&P composition. Now, we don't think we'll get there, but do we get to 30? Yeah. Yeah, we get to 30. And so that would be a doubling of those uh, of those indexes from here over the next five years. That's a very, very large rotation. So over the last few years, gold has seemingly become a very important component of the global financial framework again, as central banks have been buying record amounts of gold with their reserves. Going back to around 1980, through that time frame, central banks previously held about 70% of their reserves in gold. However, over the next 40 years, that percentage dwindled all the way down into the teens as U.S. treasuries took center stage. But now gold seems to be in favor once again for the central banks. It appears to no longer be a commodity, but rather a currency that is no cur- that is no country's liability. Do you see that as a trend that's going to continue? And how undervalued is gold relative to the stock of outstanding dollars today, let alone outstanding dollars that could be coming as a result of the next Fed printing exercise. Well, that's, that's the problem today is that, you know, we have, we had the Ukraine war and we had all the sanctions and then we had all the sanctions over the last decade uh, where the white house, both Republicans and Democrats have used the sanctions weapon against uh, Libya. I mean, we can constantly, we can go on and on and on, yeah, yeah. You know, country after country, where we've used these sanctions, and um, the emerging world is is looking at that and then putting more money into into into, into gold. And so, and we saw this with Putin. He he took his gold up from like the last eight years up into the whole Ukraine war. And then he took his treasuries from, I think, 180 billion to, to zero. Mm-hmm. And so that is is creating this crowding in gold. But I think if you think of platinum, um, all the platinum, every, everybody knows that all the gold ever mined would go into an Olympic swimming pool and fill it up to here. Um, but all the platinum ever mined in the history of humanity would only go up to your ankles in that pool. So, I just look at there's so many central banks that have gone into gold because of these sanctions and because of this aggressive posture and they want diversification away from the dollar that um, I think the value of the trade now is, is in silver and, and platinum and some of the other like the, the, the gold to platinum ratio is at the highest level uh, in 20 years. So, so let's talk a little bit more about that, about, about platinum and silver, Larry. Um, in your book, When Markets Speak, you shared your thesis on both. Would you dive into your investment thesis on both platinum and silver a little bit here? Well, the big one for platinum is if you think of the electric vehicle assumed path, right, of electric vehicles, penetration into the market in the last 10 years. So – there was this very aggressive path of assumed penetration that is now crumbling that whole. So the hybrid sales as a percentage of like the market relative to EVs is exploding. Mm -hmm. And so hybrids have catalytic converters and the, the metals that you need for hybrids. It's just so any kind of car that burns oil or gas, will have a catalytic catalytic converter to try to control emissions. And so the assumption was like five, six years ago that the EV path would be so spectacular that platinum and palladium were in in grave risk. They've been report after report after report. Now, if you look at Toyota and some of these auto sales, these, these hybrid sales are exploding. 
and you're pushing out the EV penetration. And that's and that with a potential Fed shift and a crowded dollar, that potentially could take platinum from say just around thousand to uh, you know potentially, I think potentially you know two thousand. Wow. And so what are you seeing for silver with the electrification movement, the artificial intelligence, obviously the expansion of war weapons, et cetera. Um, silver has been running a deficit cumulatively each year for the last five years and growing. Um, now I understand that there's above ground stocks that are preventing some kind of squeeze from taking place with silver, but that could only last so long. So what, what's your thesis with silver? Yeah, I think that's it where, Silver, you've got the huge deficit builds for the last multiple years. You've got these giant solar um, facilities going up in, in all over the world in China. And everybody knows that you know the two-sided solar panels uh, use double the silver. And so that's one of the new innovations. So there's all these innovations for silver. And but because because the of the rate hikes and because of the threat of recession, all of these really bullish parts of the silver case uh, of kind of like are under the surface now. But once we, 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 once we start going to a rate cuts environment and the global economy improves, and then we, we get more investment in, in kind of the green technologies, that's where you're going to have this huge kind of like supply problem versus demand problem for silver and silver could go to like, you know, 60, $60 an ounce, but it's so hard to, to figure out, I mean, you could, see, you could see it starting. Like, why, you know, why is you look at the gold silver ratio, right? That has been in this like long term bear market for silver. And it's, it just broke in the last, you know, month. And so right now it's around 77. Um, but in a real bull market, that should be in the 50s. It may be, and in some bull markets, it could, it could be in like in the, it could be in the 30s. So the gold silver ratio, the, the relationship yeah. between gold price and silver, is uh, that that that's telling you that chart and the, and, the, and the trading in the market when markets speak, that's telling you that that ratio is going down. Um, and that means that silver is going to be a higher price relative to gold. And so the ratio probably ends up in the 50s and right now it's at 77. So one, one final question on the precious metals, and that is relating to gold. I understand that, you know, it's more of a currency these days. And the Western investor has really sat <laughs> out the gold trade over the last, you know, four months, three months since it's really moved. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are, you're not saying that you think gold is going down or maybe even stagnant. But that are you saying that gold is going to go up? It's just that silver and platinum are going to go up faster. I would say first and foremost, silver and platinum are going to go up a lot faster. But I also am worried that the amount of, because you just had the Ukraine war, because you had all the Russian sanctions, you had this big, incredible run from China into gold. And I just think that it's probably gotten ahead of itself. And um, I, I still am a big gold bull, but I, I just, I suspect that, that the other metals are going to offer you better risk reward. That makes sense. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. And before we wrap up here and I ask Larry our final question, I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It's free. <laughs> Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer <laughs> economy, markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and every single expert interview that we conduct, just like this one. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote. It's based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled, If You Don't Own Gold, You Know Neither History Nor Economics. This free gift is a must read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe and receive this free gift on us. Also, I'm positive that you've enjoyed this conversation with Larry as much as I have please let him know. Hit that like and subscribe button and leave a comment below the video. Larry, in wrapping up our discussion, my final question is about portfolio positioning. Based on all we've discussed today and with your experience and worldview as the backdrop, how are you positioning for the months and years ahead? What assets do you like? What assets do you absolutely want to stay away from? What's the portfolio for the next three to five years? 
Well, first and foremost, um, your Rio Tintos, your BHPs, you know, these types of big, your valets, like valet right now is really cheap because there's some emerging market stress, but your big metal companies, um, those are going to be a much bigger part of the S&P. And so that's where your portfolio composition wants to be in the XME or global, like I said, the global, if you just look at the uh, um, EWU portfolio, which is global value, look at the companies in there and it's BP, it's Rio, um, it's Glencore. And so mm -hmm. those types of portfolios are going to, I think th those types of stocks are, are, are starting to and actually, they've been starting to last, like they're actually outperforming the S&P for the last like three, four years. And, but they're, this is, that's, but I think that the probability that there's a massive outperformance from that global value. Um, and then you get fund managers like David Einhorn that focus on value. Uh, you've got ETFs that uh, the cash cows, uh, COWZ. So you've got all these ETFs that focus on value stocks. And so that's where you want to start. And then you want to have a broad balance around, you know, oil and gas, uh, metals, and, and then some of the more you know, speculative metals. And, and, but you never, you don't want to have more than, you know, you don't want to have more than you know, 40% of your portfolio in these things. Um, but overall, right now, the percentage of American portfolios that's in, you know, that's in these asset classes is, is like less than five. I, I guess you can say if you go best the, based on the S&P composition, it's 14%. But if you, if you look at the average investor, they, they're not long, um, you know, that much oil and gas and metals and mining, uranium stocks. It's a, I yeah, so, yeah, I appreciate all that. And, and what are you staying away from? What do you not just not like? Well, I, I think that, I really think that the big tech thing is is run its course. Um, you know, we said this in 2022 and then the stocks dropped a lot. Uh, and now we're back up through those highs. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's so, I just think that there's this passive concentration is, is going to have such an unwind and a real nasty, like, it's the type of thing where I've seen these scandals in my whole career. And if pe people, like, people will not, um, not until there's some pain will people actually start to gang up and out these things. Like, like right now, it's everybody's just, fine and dandy that 20% of the S&P is in three stocks. And, and I think that within the next year or two, there'll be like a lot of, uh, there'll be like investigations around the S&P inclusion committee, or there'll be all kinds of like potential regulations around, around an S&P structure. That's interesting. Well, Larry, thank you for coming on to the Metals and Miners podcast, for being so generous with your time, your analysis, and all your ideas. It's been amazing to spend this time with you. Would you please share with the viewers any final thoughts that you want to leave with those tuning in, where they could learn more about your work and how they can connect with you? Well, what we do is behind me, we run a Bloomberg chat with 80% of our revenues are from hedge funds, pension funds, mutual funds. And so we hold a conversation with the investors during the day. And then we recap the conversation and the intelligence. So we're like crowdsourcing intelligence. And so that's part of what the, so the bear traps isn't so much a newsletter. It's more like, okay, let's see what the professionals are doing. What, you know, what are the real, what we call the buy side. So you're, 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 you're not your sell side. Your sell side is the banks. They're trying to sell you something. They are acts. They, they are, there's biases. Um, but we watch the actual investors and what they're doing on, on the buy side. We're watching the mutual funds and pension funds. And so, and we recap kind of that, crowdsource intelligence for for everybody in uh, in our bear trap support. Well, the Twitter handle is at convert bond at convert bond. And then uh, the, the it's at it's the website is the bear trap support dot com. The bear trap support dot com. So I'll, I'm going to put all of that up uh, for everybody to follow. The the links will be up there. I'm going to put a copy, a cover of the book up there um, and probably have a link. Is it up on Amazon right now? Yeah, it's done well. I mean, it's been in the top, you know, five or so. It was number one for a long time. 
but now it's it's going back and forth. But yeah, it's on Amazon and it's it's one of the top business books selling in the, in the world. Okay, so I'll put a link to the Amazon page for everybody. Um, and everyone just go follow Larry. If you're not, you need to follow him. He's a wealth of information. And clearly with all the people he's touching through the bear traps report and through the 600 uh, hedge fund folks that he's in connection with all the time, uh, you know, that's smart money. They're at the forefront of everything that's taking place in the market. So Larry, I look forward to having you back on sometime soon. Thank you for being here with us and everybody else. Thank you. for. Thank watching. you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. All the best. I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It's free. <laughs> Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer, <laughs> economy, markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and every single expert interview that we conduct, just like this one. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote. It's based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled, If You Don't Own Gold, You Know Neither History Nor Economics. This free gift is a must-read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe and receive this free gift on us.